Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, you'll see that the title of this talk is one that was given to me, What I Do Now That I Did Then and Why. In regard to this uh, presentation, I uh, have disclosures as noted here, none of which conflict with this presentation. There's no off-label uses uh, shown within this pre presentation as well. So this presentation I'm going to give you is actually one that's been expanded from an assignment I was given by Dr. Sheldon Lynn, who was our program chair at the AOFS meeting at the uh, recent annual meeting in New Orleans. Uh, and it was a past present symposium that basically dealt with exactly what I said, what I do now that I did then and why. And my topic was chronic lateral ankle instability. So as you all know, inversion ankle sprains occur very commonly. Uh, in the United States, there's one for every second of the day, uh, and most of those, of course, are in uh, recreational sports. And some of those inversion ankle sprains can lead to chronic instability. In fact, when you look at the statistics, about 20 to 25 percent of individuals suffering an inversion ankle sprain will develop chronic pain or dysfunction. About 10 to 30 percent uh, of people sustaining an ankle sprain will develop mechanical or functional instability, which I'll discuss in one second. And some patients, unfortunately, will not do well with non-operative management, will have chronic uh, dysfunction, oftentimes due to persistent inversion instability, and will actually request or require surgical intervention. So the first question we have is, what is instability? And there are different types of instability that we um, try to define. One is mechanical instability. This is the one that you'll notice an increased laxity on examination of the patient. It's usually asymmetric, and with the patient relaxed, you can actually test for an anterior drawer and inversion instability, and if you can actually detect that there's a significant gross instability on one ankle as compared to the other, that's a person who'll have mechanical instability. The use of stress radiographs to highlight that mechanical instability, that asymmetric inversion instability has been controversial in the past, but certainly that's something that can be done because if you do demonstrate increased inversion um, and tibial tailor tilt on stress radiographs as compared to the contralateral, people would say, okay, that is a mechanical instability pattern. Now, there's also functional instability. Functional instability is where you may examine the patient and find that they're relatively stable and without asymmetry, and yet they come in and they present with a subjective feeling of giving way, that they have these repetitive inversion um, incidences that uh, interfere with not only, not only the recreational activity, but activities of daily living. And again, that's functional instability. Now, functional instability can be caused by weakness or poor proprioception, poor recovery after a prior inversion ankle sprain. So again, those are the two types of instability patterns that we discuss. Now, let's define lateral instability even further. Is it just that that's limited to the tibial tailor joint? Does it have a component of subtalar joint instability, or is it a combination of both? And again, I'm going to highlight that in just a, a moment as well. So again, not only are we looking at the types of instability, mechanical or functional, but where does the instability occur along that lateral aspect of the ankle and hind foot is important as well. So as I look back on this and said, okay, how have I dealt with inversion instability in the individual with chronic symptoms since I began my practice in the mid-1980s. And you look at what the choices were back in the 1980s for dealing with these particular patients with chronic inversion instability. You have your director and a top repair, which include the Brostrom, the Gould modification, the Carlson modification, and then others that directed some of the attention to the subtalar joint. And then you have 10 and graft procedures, Elmsley, Watson-Jones, Evans, Chrisman Snook, the Colville, um, and others um, that could be considered in the 1980s. Let me just briefly go into some of these uh, different types of reconstructions that I was exposed to and actually performed uh, in my training and early in my career. So my history of lateral, lateral ligament reconstructions first began in 1983 and in which we used the Evans procedure. Um, in 1984, we progressed to utilizing the Watson-Jones procedure. In 1985, we started um, exploring the, uh, the opportunities with the Chrisman Snook defined procedure. All of these three procedures utilize the perineus brevis as a tendon weave in some way or form. 
Now let's just go into this a little bit more specifically. This is the Evans procedure. This is a procedure that sacrificed the entire perineus brevis. So you would basically transect the perineus brevis above the level of the superior retinaculum, and then you would go ahead and you'd drill a hole through the fibula, and you'd basically reroute the entire perineus brevis through the fibula. Now, in this procedure, your ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is minimally restrict restricted, but you did restrict inversion at the subtalar and ankle level. This procedure, as you can see, the way it's diagrammed there, this would have uh, a restraint to inversion, but it had very poor control of anterior tailor translation, the so-called anterior drawer. When you look at some of the outcomes that came out in the 1980s and early 90s in regard to the Evans, there was about a 80 to 96 percent good and excellent outcome in the short term. However, only 33 percent of individuals resumed an athletic activity and 50 percent had satisfactory results after 14 years, and that's really not a very good outcome when you talk about uh, uh, this particular procedure. So again, you'll see that in the first diagram I had, they brought the perineus brevis through the back of the fibula to the front and sutured it there. In this diagram, you'll see there on the right, it's basically a tunnel directly in the front of the fibula, X and out posteriorly about two centimeters more proximal. So again, that's the Evans procedure, sacrificed the entire perineus brevis and created a tenodesis effect on the lateral aspect of the ankle. Now this was the Watson Jones, it was similar to an Evans, and then again, it was originally described as taking the entire perineus brevis away to use as a tendon weave, a graft type procedure. <clears throat> but you'll see in this situation, they didn't stop in the fibula, they actually went and rerouted the tendon through a tunnel in the tailored neck. So you needed a quite a long graft to make this work. So you ended up making a long incision over the proximal aspect of the leg and harvested the entire perineus brevis at the musculotendinous junction, rerouted through the fibula, through the tailor uh, neck tunnel. And this procedure, as you can imagine, had better control of tailor translation. It was actually a very good procedure in regard to minimizing anterior drawer. But the ill effect was that you also significantly restricted subtalar motion by doing so. If you looked at the outcomes of the Watson Jones, that again came out in the 1980s, it was, again, 80 to 93% good and excellent short-term results, but there was unsatisfactory results and deterioration of the time, particularly to the subtalar joint, where a 60% late arthritis um, uh, finding was noted. So again, you'll, you'll see there that it's uh, one that probably restricted inversion too much. From there, we went to the Christman Snook, or the so-called modified Elmsley procedure. And you'll see here, this is different in that you only used half of the perineus brevis. So you split the perineus brevis and you rerouted it the other direction. So you routed it from the front of the fibula to the back and then down to the calcaneus. So it very nicely approximated the course of the calcaneal fibular ligament. It did not do a good job of mimicking or reproducing the course of the anterior tailor fibular ligament, however. You'll see where that graph's coming in almost 60 degrees to the uh, typical uh, course of the anterior tailor fibular ligament. So again, not good control of the anterior drawer, very good control of, of the calcaneal fibril ligament. And this was uh, outcomes as noted in 1985. This was a study uh, highlighted 57 patients, um, and the average follow-up was 10 years. Uh, 45 of the 48 had good excellent results. 5% had a re-injury. There was an average decrease in inversion of approximately 20 degrees as expected. So again, you'll see how that is routed from the front of the fibula uh, back down to the calcaneus, and then if you want, if you had enough tendon length, you can actually come back up to the talus again. But again, that took a tremendous amount of graft, and, and uh, I had little success with finding that much graft to go all the way back up to the talus with this procedure. So those were the procedures that I was uh, trained on and used early in my career. Then in 1987, I was exposed to the modified brostrum glue procedure. So as you all know, the modified Brostrom Gould was a local anatomic repair that utilized the dense scar tissue from the prior injury to reef and to restore stability along the lateral aspect of the ankle. So basically this is where our attention went to was modifications of the Brostrom. Now the original Brostrom procedure described in 1966 actually was one that typically only repaired the anterior tailor fibril ligament. You took that dense scar tissue from prior injury and you imbricated it 
on the anterior aspect of the fibula. Only 30% of Brossom's original series directed attention to the calcaneal fibula ligament. In his early studies, he had an 80% success rate, which, as we know from our lateral ligament reconstructions, is not very good. But that was the brostrum, and everybody found it to be a very simple procedure, utilize local tissue. So could it be made better? And Nathaniel Gould um, added his modification to the brostrum, which included identification and advancement of the extensor renaculum to the fibula. And then Carlson described imbricating and shortening the calcaneal fibula ligament in every procedure that he did a brostrum on. So those are the two modifications that uh, basically were added to the original brostrum to make it even better. And you could do these two in combination as well. So we get into the late 1980s, and the brostrum Gould procedure was becoming known for successfully managing both mechanical and functional ankle instability. And truly, it's been the gold standard since the early 1990s. And most everybody felt that this procedure was adequate for everyone with chronic ankle instability. Recreational, professional athletes, elite athletes, everyone. But the question is, is it really that good? And this was a case example of mine. I did a procedure on a 25-year-old athlete in 1989, um, and we did the standard brostrum Gould procedure for chronic lateral ankle instability. No underlying cable varus. He had attempted... A, he had failed uh, uh, prior attempts at bracing. Uh, the surgery itself went well, no post-operative complications, but at three months post-operative, he returned with recurrent episodes of giving way, occasionally with pain and popping, but it was, for the most part, persistent instability, recurrent instability, and noting difficulty with cutting maneuvers. So, you know, this is the typical patient response, doctor, why is my surgery not working? And on his exam, I felt like he was loose to inversion, more so than anterior drawer. And I was thinking, what did I miss? It was really time to sit back and review this case and rethink, was the modified Brostrom Gould good for everyone? And I think there's some things to consider when you dissect through this case example and the um, use of the modified Brostrom uh, Gould procedure for everyone. The first is you have to define lateral instability. It's etiology. And did I really do that? Did I really d determine how much instability this um, athlete have, and did it come from the ankle or subtalar, or was it a combination? Now, when you think about the anatomy here, the calcaneal fibula ligament is the most important ligament to the ankle, at least on the lateral side. As you know, it has the uh, it goes from the, the fibula to the uh, calcaneus, um, and that calcaneal insertion is distal to the subtalar joint. So, again, that's very important to understand that calcaneal fibula ligament not only crosses the uh, tibial tailor joint or imparts stability to the tibial tailor joint, but also imparts stability to the subtalar joint. Now, we have to consider the stability of the subtalar joint in any, every individual that we see with inversion instability because the subtalar joint, unlike the ankle joint with its mortise, has no inherent stability present with loading. It relies completely on ligament support. And if you lose the ligament support, particularly in the lateral aspect of the subtalar joint, you have, by definition, subtalar instability. So when you consider the anatomic course of the calcaneal fibula ligament, how it crosses both these joints, perhaps we should be considering a more combined pattern of instability when we see our, our athletes and our active individuals with inversion instability, tibial tailor and subtalar joint. It's a very important ligament, again, that imparts stability across both joints. So we might need to be thinking more than just uh, isolated local anatomic repairs when we talk about these patients that may have combined instability. Perhaps we, these patients require more than just a local repair, perhaps a tendon weave, an augmentation, something that crosses both joints twice, as you see here. So that is the theoretical advantage of some of the tendon weave procedures that were described back in the 80s, the so-called uh, Chrisman Snook, the modified Elmsleys, those procedures basically provided or imparted stability to not only the tibial tailor joint, but the subtalar joint as well. The other thing to consider when you dissect through this case is did I really have good enough local tissue to perform a successful local anatomic repair? So many of these individuals, you open them up and you'll see that there's very little good tissue there to sew back to. This is one individual you'll see there that has uh, basically a complete loss of tissue off the anterior to the fibrillar ligament. 
and um, uh, in that uh, area of the um, uh, ankle. And so this is a situation where I get concerned that a brostrum or modified brostrum procedure may not be adequate when the local tissue is not very good. So Bill Hamilton did so much to um, advance the thinking of lateral ankle reconstructions and particularly the use of the modified brostrum ghoul procedure. He wrote a very nice and very beautifully illustrated monograph back in 1986 that popularized the modified brostrum ghoul procedure. And truly, this was the monograph that um, escalated this procedure to become the standard in all teaching programs in the 1990s. Now, when you spoke to Bill Hamilton about this, he felt that the procedure was adequate for any instability, including subtalar instability, but it did require good local tissue and it required identification and advancement of the inferior extensor renaculum, which in my experience is oftentimes hard to do. That inferior extensor renaculum isn't always easy to identify and it may not be very stout as well. But in fairness to the modified brostrum group procedure, the early reviews that were uh, published on this procedure with patients with chronic inversion ankle instability were 90% 90, 90 success. Um, but again, the question that was then evolved over time was, that's very good, 90% is great, but is it good enough for everyone and for all conditions? And what we're finding is it probably is not. Uh, Mike Coughlin, Dr. Colville, myself, uh, we've all basically uh, discussed and published um, granted level five evidence-based medicine, but that perhaps the brostrum gua procedure is not um, the go-to procedure, the gold standard for everybody. Uh, there's been other uh, papers uh, discussing the modified bro uh, brostrum gua for post-op instability. Um, this was the level four study back in 1989. There was another one in 1987. Uh, basically, they found that despite a well-done modified brostrum gua procedure, uh, there were cases of recurrent post-op instability. Um, this is another one done by Dr. Mafuli and his group um, uh, in England uh, that, uh, again, discussed that 16% uh, of the patients undergoing this procedure had decreased the level of activity and only 20, and 26% actually abandoned all athletic activity. And another uh, paper done um, by uh, the group out of Baltimore uh, showed that you can actually elongate your brostrum repair uh, with unprotected motion postoperatively. So uh, perhaps it's not as uh, uh, reliable as what we hope for, particularly in certain individuals. And I too believe that there are times when you need more substance than chronically scarred tissue can provide. As Mike Coffin says, there's times when you just need more octane than what that local uh, dense scar tissue may be, may be able to provide. In my own experience, I found that some of the poor results and recurrences I've had with the modified brostrum ghoul procedure are high demand people. They may be people with the subtalar combined instability, uh, poor tissue with longstanding insufficiency, uh, the obese, the, the increased BMI type patient or heavy laborer. In uh, my particular practice where I deal with a, a large number of uh, football players, uh, they're large, they're very high demand and they tend to stretch out their brostrum procedure uh, to a greater degree as do those people with lateral overload from cable varus or those with uh, generalized laxity, possibly due to a collagen um, or connective tissue disorder. And those, of course, that have uh, uh, the need for revision surgery, perhaps the modified brostrum gluid is not adequate. So again, where we're going is that there are cases where you'll have individuals of poor local tissue, high demand cases that may be better served with an augmentation or the addition of an anatomic tendon weave procedure to the brostrum itself. Basically what we're trying to do is form some type of tenodesis uh, from the fibula to the talus and the calcaneus. And what we're looking for here is basically a simple check rein. That's what we're trying to do is we're trying to add a little augmentation to the brostrum gluon to serve as a check rein to inversion stresses. So, what we came up with was the idea of adding a small tendon weave to the brostrum, basically augmenting our brostrum procedure with a slip of the Pyrenees brevis, roughly one third of the size of the Pyrenees brevis in what we call the split Evans procedure as illustrated there on the slide. So in 1989, I had my first case of an anatomic repair, the brostrum, in which I added this split Evans type of check rein. 
This was a professional basketball player. I was concerned about the amount of stress and the cutting he was going to be placing on the lateral aspect of the ankle, um, and I wanted to add something to the brostrum. I actually consulted Dr. Hamilton and got his blessing uh, prior to doing this particular procedure in which I used a portion of the perineus brevis. So again, I'm, I'm harvesting just a portion, not the entire perineus brevis, but just a portion to augment my brevis. So this is where we started our journey with the modified brostrum split Evans procedure for chronic lateral ankle instability. Um, it was basically an augmentation of local repair with a check rein utilizing a tendon weave. And going back to the title of this talk, I started this in 1989, and I'm still doing it the same way today because it's worked in my hands. So let me walk you through the surgical technique. So I prefer longitudinal incision over the perineal tendons. I preserve the superior perineal vernaculum in all individuals, as long as there's no evidence of perineal subluxation. We examine the perineals. We address the pathology, as you see there in that uh, image on the right. Uh, that's a case of severe attenuation of the calcaneal fibrillar ligament and a complete rupture of the anterior to the fibrillar ligament. Now, what we do is we go ahead and we want to harvest a slip of the perineus brevis. So we're just basically harvesting the anterior third. What I'll do is I use a heavy nylon, like a number two nylon suture, to act like almost like a giggly saw to go ahead and to split that tendon. You'll see how nicely that's delivered out distally. We're still attached to the base of the fifth metatarsal, and I have not violated the superior perineal or anaculum to harvest that. Um, so again, you leave that tendon intact distally, and you can uh, further split it um, uh, 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 to ensure that it's almost independent from the remaining perineus brevis. So then we go ahead and we place a fibular tunnel to reroute this slip of the perineus brevis. So we actually drill the hole at a site between the calcaneofibular and anterior to the fibular lig ligament insertions. So we place a drill hole there, and we exit about two, two and a half centimeters above the tip of the fibula along the posterior fibular groove region. And you can do this utilizing whatever interference screw system you prefer. Now, we're still doing the brostrum procedure, so we're still doing our local repair of the ligaments, as described by uh, Brostrom and Carlson. I prefer non-absorbable sutures, usually like a 2-0 uh, type of non-absorbable suture for this. And um, again, if you want to use suture anchors for uh, advancement of the anterior to the fibular ligament, you certainly can. When we secure our calcaneal fibrillar ligament, we do that first, and we do it with the foot in ever eversion and maximum plantar flexion. Then we maintain that eversion as we bring the ankle and foot into dorsiflexion and also apply posterior displacement to the tibial tailor joint so as to gain the shortest uh, possible distance for securing our anterior tailor fibrillar ligament. At that time, we go ahead and we then reroute our perineus brevis slip through our drill hole in the fibrillar tunnel and then secure it with an interference screw, usually a four, 4.5 millimeter screw. Now, when you do this, it's very important that you place the hind foot and ankle in a neutral position. This should not be a, a maximum eversion position. You don't want to over-tighten that. Again, that's what happened with some of those original early uh, procedures was it over-tightened the subtalar joint. There was no inversion. Those people developed subtalar arthritis. So you don't want to over-tighten this. You want to maintain the hind foot and ankle in neutral um, uh, as you uh, place your interference screw. Once that's done, you go ahead and you can advance your extensor renaculum as described by Gould. So when you can identify that, you can advance it. And then we'll, you see us there, we're just uh, basically taking the slip of the perineus brevis that's exit out of the posterior aspect of the fibula. We're just securing it there with another suture just to uh, have as little um, uh, fail safe. And there's our renaculum. We're advancing it up as described by Gould. And again, we're doing all this with the ankle and dorsiflexion and eversion. So you'll see they're very, very nice and, and secure. So, does this procedure work? What are the complications? Well, we've, uh, we've done several series looking at our, our procedure, the Brostrom Split Evans procedure. This was the first one we did by Dr. Pierre Girard uh, back in 1998. He presented this to the AOFAS, and we looked at every patient. We had them come in. They got a physical therapy and Cybex evaluation. In our series of patients, we found no over-tightening, no loss of perineal strength, uh, despite the harvest of the anterior third of the perineus brevis and our AFS score was quite good at 98.2. Uh, 
um, Dr. Tor Arduin, he went ahead and, and did a follow-up study uh, for the AAOS in 2011. These were 20 patients he found with an average of 8.5 years of follow-up. The average inversion loss was 51%, as we'd expect. Uh, eversion strength was equal. There was one case of asymptomatic subtalar arthritis noted. We've done two published retrospective series. The first was done by Gerard in uh, 1999. Um, again, it uh, mimicked the results he presented to the AOFS. And this was the most recent publication done by Andrew Shu um, in January of 2016, again, uh, noting the uh, uh, very good intermediate and long-term outcomes of the modified Bross Memmons procedure for patients with chronic lateral ankle instability and showing no significant subtalar arthritis risk, um, no perineal um, uh, tendon strength loss, and no recurrent instability. So again, this was uh, Dr. Shu's study. Again, you'll see I've highlighted in yellow, minimal loss of perineal strength. Um, there was decreased inversion range of motion as expected, but no recurrent instability or progressive symptomatic subtalar arthritis requiring reoperation at a long-term follow-up. So again, we've shown that this procedure does work and it does hold up with time. And again, it's done well for me over the last uh, 25 plus years. I feel that it holds up better than the Brostrum. I found it to be very beneficial for athletes, workers' comp, obese patients, and heavy laborers. And anecdotally, I find that this procedure, adding this augmentation of the split perineus brevis allows for quicker and uh, more trusted rehabilitation as well. The bottom line is basically this is a poor man's internal brace. You may all be um, familiar with that particular artificial uh, ligament augmentation uh, that uh, has gained popularity recently. Uh, but again, this is a very, very similar device, only it's the patient's tissue, um, and it allows for biologic ingrowth um, as well. So again, this is how I look at this particular check rein device, very similar to that of the internal brace. Let me just, uh, again, walk you through the procedure. I think this would be very helpful just to show, again, uh, one more example of the procedure in more detail if you'd like to consider doing this in any of your patients with um, uh, basically at more risk uh, than what you might feel comfortable just doing a Brostrom Gould on. This is a 25-year-old professional volleyball player with recurrent inversion ankle instability. Um, he's had a number of sprains, and it's become a performance issue at this point. Uh, he has a, a significant uh, difficulty performing due to this inversion tendency. You can see there the positive anterior drawer, the positive um, inversion uh, stress test that we did. So here's our incision, uh, a longitudinal incision, curvilinear skin incision over the course of the perineal tendons. You see I've identified the extensor inaculum. There's our two perineal tendons. You bring those two perineal tendons um, inferiorly, and that allows you to visualize the calcaneofibrillar ligament. In this situation, the tissue is very poor. The calcaneofibrillar ligament is almost uh, indistinguishable. It's, uh, it's been quite attenuated. Now, what we're doing here is we're dividing the anterior tetrafibrillar ligament, the underlying capsule, off the anterior aspect of the distal fibula. Uh, we want to expose the anterior aspect of the distal fibula. We want to denude all the soft tissue to create a, a nice bleeding bed of bone to um, advance that inferior extensor inaculum, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, to advance the enter to the fibrillar ligament back to. So again, you can use your curette, your rangeur. Now, this is identifying and transecting the calcaneal fibrillar ligament. So you see we actually have identified it, we see it's attenuated, we're dividing it, and then we'll actually take out a segment before we imbricated it so as to shorten it. Um, this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is just to leave the, um, the ligament intact and use a box suture just to act like a mattress suture to, to pull it all together, to imbricate it together. But in this situation, we actually formally transected the calcaneal fibrillar, fibrillar ligament and then took a, a section out, and then we're going to repair it primarily. This is showing here how we harvest the anterior third of the perineus brevis. That's our heavy nylon suture. I've identified the anterior third of the perineus brevis, put a hemostand under, grab our nylon suture, and then I can basically leave the superior perineal nacinum intact as I harvest this anterior third and then transect it up proximally. So it's a nice little trick to use, just using a heavy number two nylon as a giggly saw, so to say, and then there's our anterior third of the perineus brevis that's been harvested. 
And again, you can split that further down distally and get it as independent from the remaining perineus brevis as possible. Here's our drill hole. Again, it basically bisects the insertion of the calcaneal fibrillar ligament and the anterior talar fibrillar ligament, and then exits out the fibula approximately two and a half centimeters proximally. And now you'll see we'll just pull that slip of the perineus brevis through the drill hole. Very simple. And that's our check ring. Now we'll go ahead and we have to complete our broster procedure. We're going to advance the anterior titular fibular ligament back up to that denuded uh, uh, area of bone. You can do a pants over vest type of uh, maneuver as shown here. Uh, we also are in this particular situation right now, we're actually suturing our calcaneal fibular ligament that we've actually taken a portion out of. Here's actually the um, advancement of the anterior to the fibrillar ligament. So again, whichever way you want to do your Brostrom uh, Carlson type of procedure is uh, certainly at your discretion and really has no bearing on the augmentation, the so-called split Evans itself. So here I'm using my non-absorbable sutures. I'm doing a pants over vest uh, technique and I'm going to advance that attenuated portion of the anterior to the fibrillar ligament back to the denuded bone bed we created on the interest of the distal fibula and suture in place. If you'd like, you're certainly welcome to use uh, some type of suture anchor device here to accomplish the same. And there is the mattress sutures being placed, pants over vest type of technique, and you'll see that that uh, large cuff of tissue then is basically uh, lined directly on top of the denuded bone on the distal fibula previously created. Now again, we're suturing the ligaments, eversion, plantar flexion for the calcaneal fibrillar ligament, and eversion, dorsiflexion with posterior translation for the anterior to the fibrillar ligament. And there's our perineus brevis slip that's now been set into place and has been secured with interference screw inferiorly, and now we're going to close the sheath of the uh, perineal tendons, and then advance the inferior extensor renaculum. So what this gives you is the feeling of immediate stability. You, it's uh, not only are you relying on the stability imparted by the Brosman Gould procedure, but you've added your check rein. And then we're testing to make sure that he still has eversion, but we have limited inversion from neutral on. Unfortunately, not all lateral ankle reconstructions are successful, even with the augmentation of the split brevis. Um, just to uh, finish this up, what do I do if I have a failed reconstruction, one that's been done well even with augmentation? Well, I'll typically revise it with a modified ELMS that utilizing a free graft. Uh, Dr. Armand Kleeklin talked about using a uh, toe extensor tendon to do this. I basically prefer utilizing a semitendinosus or gracilis tendon. You can certainly use an autograft, but I prefer allograft, uh, so I don't create a, a, a harvest situation uh, in the patient. So again, that's typically our tendon graft that we use is the semitendinosus or gracilis to do a salvage tendon weave procedure. We'll secure the graft into the talus with an interference screw, and then we'll drill holes through the fibula and through the calcaneus to set this tendon weave in place. Again, a procedure that has been popularized by Colville and again by Dr. Coughlin as well, and in which we have used quite successfully over many years. So you'll see here that we've already set our allograft into the talus. Now we're placing it through a drill hole in the fibula, and then we'll drill a hole through the calcaneus and we'll deliver the graft out the medial aspect of the calcaneus. This allows us, this pull through technique allows us to set tension on the uh, tendon weave procedure uh, prior to placing our interference screws. Once we have that tension right, we're certainly we're not over tension. We don't want to be in maximum eversion. We want to be in basically a neutral position in regard to the hind foot and ankle. We'll go ahead and we'll place an interference screw to secure the tendon into the calcaneus. Um, whereas you can drill line to line, we'll typically place a larger interference screw than what we drilled for due to the soft cancellous bone of the calcaneus itself. If you want, you can also add an interference screw at the anterior aspect of the fibula as well. Um, having already placed interference screws in the talus calcaneus, you certainly may add an additional one at the fibula. 
And I think whenever you're dealing with a failed procedure, you're having to salvage uh, uh, lateral ankle uh, instability situation, always go back and look at the posture of your patient's lower extremity, particularly the foot and ankle. Is there varus? Is there cable varus? Because that certainly can be a cause of soft tissue reconstruction um, uh, failure is to not recognize the persistent overload created by a cable varus foot posture. So, again, if I'm doing a revision surgery, a salvage surgery for failed uh, soft tissue reconstruction laterally, and if there's any evidence of cable varus, I'm going to go ahead and try to minimize that lateral overload by doing some type of bony osteotomy. Uh, you have to determine whether the varus is at the hind foot level or the forefoot level uh, or both, and you can do that by utilizing a Coleman block test. And then again, you want to correct that varus or cable varus malalignment by doing some type of osteotomy. It may be a calcaneal osteotomy, either a Dwyer or a Malerba, as you see there in the bottom, possibly with the addition of a first ray elevation, again, as you note in that x ray in the bottom. And rarely, rarely would you consider maybe a tibial osteotomy to help correct the varus um, in unique situations. So again, things you need to consider in the revision or salvage situation. As far as post-operative following these lateral ligament uh, reconstruction procedures, I typically will mobilize my patients in mild eversion and neutral dorsiflexion for two weeks, keep them strictly non wapering at two weeks, then I'll place them into a walker boot or cast, depending upon their compliance or their comfort level. But again, avoiding all inversion until six weeks post-operative. At six to eight weeks, I advance them to an air stirrup or some type of active brace um, orthosis. I begin uh, active, act, active uh, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and, and, and perineal strengthening as well. But in regard to perineal strengthening, you want to initiate resistance but without inversion. We basically orthopedically clear our active individuals by 12 to 16 weeks, 16 weeks post-op, meaning that we allow them to advance a functional recovery program. If there's concerns about their strength characteristics, you can certainly do a Cybex or Biodex um, analysis, which will give you some objective measurement of their strength recovery or any deficits they may have. And if the strength looks good, then you can reintegrate them into their sport. I'll typically recommend they use a brace for sports for at least six months, if not indefinitely, following these type of soft tissue reconstructive procedures. So in summary, this chronic lateral ankle instability situation has been one I've been very interested in for uh, 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 many, many years. And, and what I've realized, just like a bunion deformity, you have to treat every patient individually. Not every case of lateral ankle instability is the same. Um, and you have to therefore have more than one procedure available to you to get the best outcome. Uh, not everybody's gonna do well with a modified brostrum or modified brostrum ghoul type procedure. There are times when you're gonna need add, you're gonna need to add more octane, as Mike Coughlin says. And there will be situations where there's significant cable varus that you have to consider osteotomy, osteotomies for. Um, in conclusion, my approach now to chronic lateral ankle instability is doing the modified brostrum really only when I need extremes of motion preserved the ballet participant, somebody involved in gymnastics, perhaps adolescents that have open physes that I don't want to drill a hole through their fibula, or those with mild functional instability. These are people that may do fine with a modified brostrum ghoul procedure, um, uh, you know, utilizing uh, not only a imbrication of both of the ligaments, but also adding the extensor renaculum um, as well. I must say that I still do this augmented check rein repair the Brostrom split Evans on the vast majority of patients that I deal with. Uh, those with mechanical instability, uh, those with hind foot varus, and I have to consider an osteotomy with those as well. So again, I would say that probably more than 90% of patients that I do surgery on for chronic lateral ankle instability uh, undergo the check rein augmentation. And then I say the free graft, the one I showed you lastly, uh, for failed augmented procedures or those with flail ankles or neuromuscular deficits. So again, this is a procedure that I've been doing since 1989. I still do now because it works for me. But again, I hope this has been uh, of interest to, to you all, or at least understand that not everybody is suited well to just undergo a simple modified brostrum ghoul procedure for chronic lateral ankle instability. Thank you very much. Here's, here's one right here. Um, 
how do you think the internal brace from Arthrex compares with this foot Evans augmentation and uh, thereby preserve the brevis? Um, I, I think the internal brace is a very um, helpful device, uh, particularly if you aren't comfortable harvesting a slip of the perineus brevis. If you have somebody who's older, who their perineus brevis is um, not present or not in good condition, um, I think that the internal brace is an excellent device uh, to augment with. Um, again, the advantage of adding a check ring. So I think that it is um, a helpful device in the situations where your perineus brevis tendon is not suitable to harvest a simple one-third of it. Again, I have uh, uh, utilized internal brace in special circumstances, people who are going to have to get back to their sport in a very, very short period of time, um, or those with pre-existing perineal tendon pathology. Um, the and internal brace really, if you look at, and I've done many studies, the internal brace and the um, split brevis are very, very close in the same course that they follow. Uh, you'll, the internal brace is placed from the anterior aspect of the distal fibula into the tailor neck, and the vector that we use for the split brevis is not that far off. So again, I find that where the advantage of the split brevis is is primarily to check rein inversion more than anterior drawer. I'm relying more on my brostrum ghoul procedure for the anterior drawer. I think where internal brace probably has an advantage is it probably uh, does more for augmenting and reducing anterior drawer than it does calcaneofibrillar ligament. Uh, again, uh, there's a question here. Um, uh, do you always fix both the anterior tibial ligament and calcaneal fibrillar ligament in every case? Um, I typically do. I mean, I think that you certainly will have those situations where your anterior drawer is obviously pathologic, but there's not much tibial tailor tilt. And I think if you want to just do a simple um, original type of roster procedure, you certainly may do that. I must say that I almost always uh, fix both ligament complexes when I'm going in to do a lateral ligament reconstruction. Um, I think the, the morbidity of, of just placing some sutures in that calcaneofibrillar fibrillar ligament are, are minimal and it may give you some additional benefit. Again, what I've evolved to over the years though is I don't even transect the calcaneofibrillar fibrillar ligament any longer. I do basically what I call a box uh, suture, um, like a mattress suture to um, imbricate the attenuated tissue with actually dividing it. It seems to work very, very well. There's another question here. Will you use your procedures as an adjunct to primary repair? And yes, I mean, that's what this is all about, is that uh, we do the primary repair, we do the brostrum, gould, as has been described, and any way you want to do that, any little um, uh, nuances you have to, to work for you is, is great. And then all I'm doing is adding this small s slip of the perineus brevis to act as a check rein. It just gives me a little security blanket. I feel more secure as particularly my, my heavy individuals, my um, people that are higher demand uh, when they go back into activities that uh, they do so with um, a little extra tissue there, a little extra scar tissue collagen uh, to support their endeavors going forward. Um, let me see, there's also another here, a good question. Um, if you're doing a calcaneal osteotomy, do you use the same incision or separate one? That's a great question. Uh, we actually have published on this, uh, our group here in Charlotte looked at this uh, many years ago, and we actually found that if you know you're going to have to do a calcaneal osteotomy with a lateral ligament reconstruction and perineal tendon reconstruction, you might be better off doing a two incision technique. We found that the wound healing was actually better using two separate incisions parallel to one another than doing one extensile um, uh, ankle hind foot uh, type exposure. So again, um, I have always utilized two incisions since uh, uh, we um, looked at those particular results and published that article probably over 10 years ago. But those are all very, very good questions. Thank you. Here's one more question. Do you see isolated subtalar joint instability very often? And I don't, I don't. And I usually, to be honest, if 
you have somebody with significant inversion instability um, clinically, you know they feel loose, they're asymmetric, and let's say you do a stress radiograph and you find very little increased tibiotalar tilt to inversion stress, then I'm thinking this person may have a component of subtalar instability as well. And then I treat them as a combined instability pattern. So I'm not sure of what the incidence of true isolated subtalar joint instability is, but I do think we're missing a lot of patients who have subtalar instability combined with tibiotalar instability. And again, that's why I think a procedure like this works very well. And again, you go back and compare this to internal brace. I think this procedure does better for combined instability than internal brace because, again, inter internal, the internal brace just goes from the fibula to the talus, whereas this, again, just like some of those original procedures described in the 80s, crosses both joints. Another, another good question, have you ever had to loosen an ankle that's too tight? If so, how soon after ankle ligma is reconstructed? Um, well, that's a, a great question. I'd like to say I've never had a personal patient, one that I've done, that I thought was too tight. I have inherited some other patients who I felt like they were definitely um, fixed into eversion, um, excessive eversion with one of these augmentation procedures and I've also had some patients that have had the artificial device, the internal brace type device placed that were also too tight. And I think you have to be very, very careful when you do the procedure as has been well illustrated by Arthrex and, and, uh, and uh, their consultants is you've got to be very careful with the internal brace not to over tighten it to make certain that you've got some laxity built into that structure. And it's really true for that device as well as any tendon weave procedure. You definitely don't want to um, secure those patients in eversion. You want to keep them at neutral. I think if you do run across a situation where your internal brace is placed too tight, I think it's reasonable to go in there and you can release it or revise it. Um, I have had patients that I've had actually go in and do the same for a tendon weep procedure. Um, one of the things that can help is uh, if you scope them and scope them with a distractor um, prior to open expiration, you may be able to loosen some of that up as well. Any other questions? All right, if we don't have any further questions, thank you, Dr. Anderson. What a great presentation and nice follow-up questions from our participants. We appreciate that. Thank you, Lisa.